In this video, I'm gonna tell you about the most controversial tree in the state of Texas. And I'm gonna explain why there's so freaking many of them in the hill country. Because guess what? There used to not be that many of them out there. That's right, we're talking about cedar. Love it, hate it, well you probably don't love it, but it's certainly grown in abundance over the last 150 years. And it carries with it a ton of myths. So on top of telling you why it spread so quickly in the hill country, I'm also gonna go over some of the more common questions I hear. Like where did it come from? Is it native? Is it good for anything? If so, what? And is it really sucking my land and the Edwards Aquifer dry? The list goes on, so I'll do my best to cover as many of those topics as I can. Welcome to Landowner TV, where I make you smarter about your land, one video at a time. My name is Michael Morrow, and I'm a land agent here in the state of Texas, and I help people find the perfect piece of land for them. But most importantly, I love talking about land. So I made this channel to help cover some of the more common questions I hear landowners ask. I cover topics like wildlife, livestock, grazing systems, and various other land-related topics. So if you love learning about land and wildlife, especially in the state of Texas, be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell icon so you're notified every time I upload a new video. So first of all, let me tell you a little bit about cedar. I'm talking about blueberry ash juniper, Juniperus ashi. It's actually only one of several subspecies of juniper in the US. And technically it's not a true cedar, but hey, we're still all gonna call it cedar. I know I am. And yes, it's the one in the hill country. It's the one you're thinking of. It's this one, and this one, and that one. You get the idea. Its current range covers most of central Texas in the Edwards Plateau. And its range even extends into Oklahoma and Arkansas a bit. Now this is the most recent map I could find, and it's only documenting its distribution from 1971. And we know for a fact there's a lot more here today than there was even 50 years ago. And it's really easy to see where it grows in Texas simply by browsing the hill country on Google Maps because it tends to grow in dense canopies that are dark green, such as here, there, 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 and there, and all right there. So let's start with some quick facts. For starters, it's native. That's right, it's from here, it's from right here. And it's been a part of the long-term ecology of the state of Texas for thousands of years. It can grow from 35 to 40 feet tall, but it typically starts out multi-stemmed and pretty shrubby, and it can live for over 200 years. It grows from 12 to 36 inches a year, with the younger, better water trees growing the fastest. Also, it's dioecious. Pretty sure that's how you say that. Meaning that there are male and female plants. And although initial studies of its water use indicated that cedar may consume way more than live oak trees, more recent studies have actually indicated the opposite. I've linked those studies and a lot more studies in the description of this video. So go check it out if you want to learn more on your own. One thing we do know is cedar provides excellent cover for wildlife. Both nesting cover for birds and shelter for everything else. It provides a really effective thermal rig both to warm up in the winter and, and break that wind, and it's an amazing shade tree in the summer. You've also probably heard that its bark in certain size classes is actually essential nesting material for the golden cheek warbler, which is an endangered species in central Texas. And a ton of different animals eat their berries. Deer, ringtails, and a bunch of different songbirds like robins and cedar waxwings. And this is one of the ways it spreads so quickly. Have you ever noticed that cedar tends to start frustratingly along fence lines Fence lines seem to be just covered with little itty bitty cedars. And this is because birds will eat their berries, they go sit on the fence line, they read their little newspaper, and then before you know it, all the little cedar seeds go through the system and land right on the ground. Okay, enough facts. Let's talk about why it's all over the place now when it used to not be. As I mentioned, it's native. It's native to the Texas Hill Country. Dense areas of cedar were even described by early European settlers to the eastern portions of the Edwards Plateau when they first got here. Think about the area of Los Maple State Park in Bandera and Real counties, Vanderpool, Lakey, Concan, but the cedar thickets were typically confined to the creeks and canyon lands. And although the savanna that represented the rest of the hill country was a pretty dynamic landscape, cedar was not documented to be a part of the landscapes outside of those canyon lands back then. So once again, why is it here now when it wasn't before? What changed? One word, fire. Fire historically burned rangelands every three to five years. By the way, rangelands are lands predominated by grasses and forbs with interspersed shrubs and a few trees. That's right, the hill country was historically grasslands. Think about the area west of I-35. Yep, all rangelands. And even the infamous South Texas brush country was grasslands when the European settlers first arrived. These settlers describe South Texas and many parts of the hill country that exist as brush communities today as, as sprawling grasslands with grasses that came up to the stirrups. By the way, stirrups are those little things that your feet go into on a saddle. Bing! So that's right, these shrublands and brush country had grasses up to four feet tall and were represented by little blue stem, big blue stem, Indian grass, switchgrass, 
I'll stop with the geeking out on native grasses. But suffice it to say, much different landscape. Okay, so I did say fire was the reason that they're not grasslands now. So why not? Rangelands in Texas and across the U.S., and in fact worldwide, persist over eons with a couple of different disturbance regimes, namely fire, but also a high intensity and low frequency grazing regime from the native bison, which should be a whole nother video. The thick cover of grasses that would grow up and die over that three to five year period between fires and grazing would generate an incredible fuel load for a fire to come through. Fire would come through and wipe all of vegetation to the ground and it would burn hundreds of thousands of acres at a time. When the fire did come through, any small trees that were trying to establish in those prairies were burnt and killed. And because grasses respond vigorously to fire, the grasses would then quickly regenerate, while all the seedlings and small trees would not. And cedar is another one of those brush species that doesn't respond once its top's been killed. That's why if you cut it off right at the ground, it won't grow back. Mesquite will. But the canyon lands and the creek bottoms had less influence from fire, both from the steep topography and they generally hold more moisture. Insert European settlers into the mix, they came in and eventually would claim ground and fence it. This would keep their livestock from running away. These good people, they depended on the land to give them everything they needed, including forages for their livestock. And their livestock would include cattle, sheep, and goats. And they'd keep and try to produce as many animals as possible on an annual basis. Seems reasonable, right? What they didn't realize is although the native grasses provide excellent forage for livestock, they also need a lot of time to recover before they can be grazed again. Don't worry, I'm gonna get back to the cedar question. And although the same grasses historically were grazed by bison and these huge herds that would, would nibble it down to nothing, after hammering the grasses, the bison would leave, sometimes for years at a time. And the grasses would have lots of time to recover and regenerate those leaves. However, after settlers fenced in their livestock, this provided a constant grazing pressure on the grasses, which kept the grasses short, so they could never regrow those long leaves to capture sunlight and funnel carbohydrates down into the root systems. So what happened? They died off eventually. With short grasses and light fuel loads remaining, fire didn't have an adequate fuel to go through a landscape. And since there was no fire, there was no mechanism any longer to hold back the woody vegetation from encroaching on those prairies. So over time, these brush species, like mesquite, weasatch, honey locust, granjeno in South Texas, in the hill country, cedar's what came and took over. And that's where we are today. It's thought after a pasture doesn't burn for 25 to 50 years, that, that pasture surpasses a threshold where even if the fire did come back, those trees would be too big to be killed off. So at some point, these ecosystems hit a threshold where unless you want, if you want to take them back to grasslands, you'll have to go through and mechanically do it. I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you have any more questions, feel free to shoot me an email or respond in the comments below. And if you're looking for the perfect property to buy or you're looking to market your current place, I'd be happy to help. If you like what you saw, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and hit that little bell icon so you're notified the next time I upload a video. Thanks again, and I'll see you on the next video.